paleo artist, paleontologist, invertebrate specialist, and YouTuber Prehistorica, or Christian McCall, helped me out on information and art for this video. Check out his socials in the description and comment section below. He makes some great YouTube videos and breathtaking art. The science of backboneless creepy crawlies is wild. Because we are vertebrate tetrapods, the anatomy of other vertebrate tetrapods comes more naturally to those who take a beat to compare and contrast. Invertebrates, on the other hand, are about as alien as life on Earth gets, with external skeletons, weird chitinous membranes, slabs of armor connected to all of it that are also part of the skeleton or just an entire dermis made of squishy chitinous skin that accordions in on itself. That's to say nothing of how bizarre it is to us for something to have more than four legs. Weirder still is piecing together how these extraterrestrial terrestrials evolved. In order to get to what is currently known about the evolution of the anatomy and morphology of arthropods and what has just been discovered, I think I need to provide a refresher course on basic anatomy of these critters. This will provide a framework from which I can refer to with new information. So, the arthropoda is a huge phylum of invertebrates that includes the crustaceans, insects, myriapods, chelicerates, and a bunch of extinct groups of exoskeleton-carrying segmented weirdos. Most arthropods share the characteristic of segmentation, chunks of hard chitin interlocking with one another. Their bodies are also segmented into generalized sections. Some are mostly undifferentiated, meaning all of the segments look roughly the same, while many have evolved to change up the different segments of their bodies for different functions. Most modern arthropods have a head section, a thorax section, and an abdomen section. Many members of the chelicerate group only have two body sections. Many also have sections unrelated to these major body sections like an ocular somite or a tail or telson. These segments are subdivided into a few other bits of anatomy. The outside of the arthropod body is enveloped in an exoskeleton, which, unlike us vertebrates, isn't exactly organized like a skeleton. Instead, it acts as a skeleton in providing rigidity and structure. The arthropod exoskeletal layer is a sandwich board of a basal layer, epithelium, endocuticle, exocuticle, and epicuticle. Different branches of the arthropod tree, as well as lineages that divided right before the true arthropods, have slightly different arrangements of layers in this exoskeletal layer, so keep in mind how this is just a general rule. Okay, great, we got that part down. Now, sometimes arthropods have hardened plates within the exoskeletal layer. These plates are called sclerites and are basically just super strong, highly layered bits of chitin. The ones on the top of the body are called tergites, the ones on the bottom are sternites, and the ones on the side are pleurites. They're named for the body region they are found on, the tergum, sternum, and pleura, respectively. The limbs of arthropods are characteristically segmented and jointed, hence the name of the group and the sclerites of the limbs are often more tightly segmented and jointed than the body. The armor is also often 3D, rather than just plates on various parts of the body. In this case, the soft exoskeletal layer that connects these bits of armor with one another and the body are referred to as arthrodial membranes. I was initially confused as to how these are organized because different diagrams show these membranes at different angles and that got the visual center of my brain wondering how it all fit together in 3D. So as far as it seems to my monkey brain and according to arthropod freaks I have spoken with, sclerites are bits of hard chitin armor set within the softer exoskeleton. The exoskeleton around many parts of the sclerite armor are super soft so that they act like joints to help move the hard sclerites around. In body and limb segments that need to do a lot of movement, there are smaller bits of very soft membranous exoskeleton. That would be the arthrodial membrane I mentioned, which tightly bring in the armor for maximum movement and safety. All of that was a lot of entomological blithering on my part, but I personally find it fascinating, as bugs are like an overlap between model kits and or bionicles and the natural world. 
Furthermore, I think it's important to lay down those ground rules and terms because it relates to arthrodization. The evolution of articulation of cuticular sclerites via flexible membranes. This evolutionary breakthrough was the main ingredient to the arthropod takeover. The further back in the invertebrate tree you go, the squishier and wormier things tend to get. So the organization, segmentation, and armoring of the proto-arthropods gave them an edge. No group is more characteristic of this than the lobopods, an unfortunately paraphyletic group of associated but possibly variously related soft-bodied, heavily spined, worm-like invertebrates. The lobopod group is an informal term because different groups and even members of groups have been found to place inside and outside of different groups of the panarthropoda, depending on what paper you refer to. I may be getting too much into the weeds here, but here's a fun little diagram that shows you some different hypotheses and placements of these animals. They are most likely panarthropods, organized as various sister groups, leading to more and more advanced euarthropods. See, you have the gilled lobopod forms being more closely related to the opabinians, which are closer to the radiodonts, such as everyone's favorite anomalocaris, which are again closer to the euarthropods, which are more modern forms you may be more familiar with, traditionally referred to as just arthropods. As you can see, the tardigrades and onycophorans, the velvet worms, are grouped off to the side of the tree. Remember the arthrodization thing I brought up? It's currently thought that the origin of true arthropods, the euarthropoda group, begins with the first arthrodization among the different groups around the beginning of this group. This would be the radiodonts, opabinids, and the lobopods. The mystery remains in just how fast these evolutionary changes occurred. This is complicated because of the similar body shapes shared by the lobopods and gilled lobopods clouding their true evolutionary relationships. Furthermore, some critters have been found with softer segments and others with much harder sclerotized segments closer to what is seen in the euarthropoda, but they seem to place in more primitive parts of the tree so you can see how things are hard to parse out. A new piece has been added to this dizzying puzzle that provides yet more weird data to the evolution of segments in these creepy crawlies. Paleontologists C. Didic Aria and Jean-Bernard Caron published a paper in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology in June of 2024, in which they describe a new genus and species of lobopod with unique features. Over 51 specimens of a lobopod were uncovered from the S7 locality of the Burgess Shale in Ontario, Canada, a locality called the Tulip Beds because of the huge number of tulip-shaped fossils of the sessile Cyphosoctum. This dig site was discovered all the way back in 1983 by the fine folks of the Royal Ontario Museum and saw excavation in 1996, 2000, 2008, and 2016. These expeditions resulted in over 10,000 fossils of various little Cambrian critters that continue to be prepared and described to this day. The tulip beds are specifically nested within the campsite cliff shale member of the Burgess Shale Formation. This makes the tulip beds some of the oldest sediments of the Burgess Shale, the Wuliuan stage of the Miaolingian series of the Cambrian period, so around 509 to 504.5 million years ago, with a more specific tentative dating of the fossil itself at closer to 508 million years ago. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the new lobopod. With 51 specimens known, of various angles and completeness, the majority of the anatomy of the new critter is known in great detail. According to the paper, the authors observed and documented every part and counterpart of the 51 specimens, plus used a micro-engraving tool to remove sediment from the bodies of some specimens when needed. The authors decided to name this new lobopod Entothyrios sinaustros. The genus name is composed of the ancient Greek entos, meaning inside, and thyrios, meaning shield, while the species name translates to convergent. The 51 specimens of entothyrios are not unusual for Burgess shale fossils. 
They are preserved as carbonaceous films that are replaced by aluminosilicate minerals over time. The Burgess Shale environment was a big underwater cliff that shifted and buried whole communities under silt many times over time. The tulip beds were farther away from the underwater cliff but still received that huge sediment load, hence the same preservational style as the other Burgess Shale members. Combining all information preserved in the 51 specimens results in entothyreos looking like this. A big, sluggish hell glove of waving spiny noodle arms, thick anchoring hooked legs, and a barrier of heavy thorn-shaped backspines. Entothyreos had a small nubbin-like head with a downwards pointing tube mouth, a pair of beady black eyes, a pair of floppy forward pointing leaf-shaped antennae-like organs, and a pair of blunt stubby spines at the back of the head that pointed forward. After the head, the rest of Entothyreos was composed of about 10 segments. The end of the body was capped off by a pair of limbs with heavier armor. The last segment seems to transition into the part of the body that these legs pop out of, so it doesn't really seem to count as a full segment. Each segment of Entothyreos has a pair of limbs and two pairs of dorsal spikes. The first six pair of limbs are not heavily segmented, if at all and are covered in long, thin spines called spanules. They end in a pair of fang-like claws. The next four pairs of limbs are stubbier, more obviously segmented, and end in a single claw with little tans for gripping. The last pair of legs are not connected to the side of the body segments, but are tacked on to the butt and have bigger sclerites. All limbs are coated in small, spinose, hair-like things. The thorny spikes along the back start out pointing forwards, then straighten up, and then switch to bend and backwards for maximum protection. These features don't inherently make it any more unusual than its close relatives, which the authors found to be critters included in the Luolishaniidae family. Entothyreos is closest to an as yet unnamed critter called the Emu Bay Shale Collins Monster. New studies are obviously still pending on all this, but some recent studies have argued to upgrade the Luoshianiidae to an order, so Luolishanida, and make a new family to house the cousins of Entothyreos in a proposed Collinsovermidae group. This group includes Asinocricus, Collinsium, and Collinsovermis, all of which have the similar mitten of spines look to them that Entothyreos has. Pending debate, this makes Entothyreos a tentative Colin Silvermid. Before we get too far along, let's bring in Mr. Mad from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme to get a good visual idea of how big this wormy critter was. The majority of things from the Cambrian are small, and Entothyreos is no different, as it grew to around 5 centimeters, 1.96 inches in length. That's about the size of your average large bug you may encounter. Thanks, Mr. Man. What makes Entothyreos truly unusual is that it had interlocking rings of sclerites around its limbs and a series of articulated sclerites along the inside of the back that effectively gave it an internal skeleton. The limb rings likely provided protection and are not entirely novel, aside from those on the last pair of legs, as they are not connected to one another with an arthrodial membrane. Instead, they are set within one another and attached to the exoskeleton. Each of the internal body sclerites had the dorsal spines growing out of it, and then those spines would poke out of the flexible upper layer of the body. Now to be fair, this isn't entirely out of nowhere, as many other Luolishaniids have similar structures inside their bodies, but none of them are as advanced as they are in Entothyreos, where they are almost fully formed, articulating curved sheets of chitin. For example, the Entothyreos cousin, Asinocricus, has what are called sclerotic rings, not to be confused with the rings of bone inside the eyes of reptiles, that connect its many spines underneath its integument. Functionally, this may have provided Entothyreos with more rigidity for holding on to objects in its environment, or just more structural support against physical stresses. 
These critters are hypothesized to be filter feeders that would climb up to a high point like the tip of a sponge or something and then wave their little noodle arms in the water column to sift out any edible bits of detritus to be brought to the mouth. The internal exoskeletal elements in Entothyreos could have helped the animal remain attached to its perch. Evolutionarily, though, the internal sclerites prove that the expression of articulated segments in or on the body or exoskeleton of arthropods started much earlier than the true arthropod group, all the way in the panarthropod group, possibly earlier, and in parallel amongst ancestors of arthropods. This little thorny, squishy beast proves that arthrodization arose independently, possibly more than once in the various groups that led to true arthropods. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.